It is good to be here. It's good to have you here. This morning, how many of you have ever been to a funeral? Okay. Probably, probably all of us have at one time or another been to a funeral. Have you ever been to a funeral that was interrupted? Well, I've been to two. One of them I actually kind of interrupted. Uh, it was Judy's grandmother's funeral, and we were on the way to the, uh, the graveyard, the funeral procession, and we'd pulled out on this uh, two-lane road to a four-lane road. And you know how you kind of naturally accelerate as you're going into a curve? And I looked over to check on Judy, being the compassionate guy that I am. And uh, I looked up, and all of a sudden, the procession had stopped on the four-lane road. And I was smacked into the car in front of me. Judy's head went into the windshield, busted the windshield. And um, we uh, were a little late to the burial. Uh, but we got there eventually. That was one. Then probably the most bizarre funeral I'd ever been interrupted at. It was a funeral that I was conducting. The night before, I had gone to the visitation, and I thought, well, this is kind of an interesting crowd. It was a funeral of a, a man who had taken his life. Had a uh, 11-year-old son, and had taken his, wife, his life. And at the visitation, I could tell it was quite a mixture of people. There were some uh, bikers there, kind of a motorcycle gang there. There were others that were kind of what I call gangbangers. And there were others that were kind of the goth that wore all black. And I thought, well, this is kind of an interesting assortment of, of people as they came to that. Made it through the visitation just fine. Get to the funeral the next day. And I get up to start the service. And just in the beginning where I'm reading some scripture... This young kid in the back, and it was kind of that same collection there at the funeral that day. He speaks up and says, hey, can I say something? And I'm like, okay. Well, the guy's brother and some of the family members were sitting on the front row there. And his brother looked like he just walked out of the Godfather movie. I mean, black suit, mafia. Yeah, I mean, he was, you know, Italian. And he stands up and says, no, shut up and sit down. I'm <laughs> Okay, all right. So, and then the ones that he told to shut up and sit down, they got up and they walked out of the funeral, okay? So, nothing else happened in the rest of the service. I give the message, and, and it, was, it was a pretty tough message because the 11-year-old son was right there on the front row also. Um, after the service, I go the up casket, and the people start filing by like they, they always have done. And, oh, near the end, there's this guy that comes up to the, the casket, and it's an open casket, and he starts banging on the casket. And I'm going, okay. And then he started barking. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Is we're going to miss you, big dog. Burk, 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 burk. And, um, and then that kind of gets everyone else that's behind him and everybody that goes by the casket does the same thing. They beat on the casket and they bark goodbye to big dog as, as they're going out. And they go on by out and there's a door over here. And outside here is the, the hearse. And so the crowd gathers out there. And then when all the crowd goes out there, they work the crowd up into a frenzy. And they start shouting and hollering and barking all the time. The funeral director's in there looking at me like, what in the world is going on here? So they did this thing, closed the casket, went out, led, and finally everybody got to their uh, cars. The funeral director gets on the phone and calls the police. And he says, I don't trust this group at the funeral or at the graveside. So he called the city police and they sent three or four police cars out to the graveyard uh, to line the roads as this funeral uh, burial took place. Needless to say, I've never experienced another funeral like that. That was the, probably the most bizarre interruption of a funeral I've ever seen. But believe it or not, there is someone else that liked to interrupt funerals. In Luke chapter 7, we find this story. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. The young man who had died was a widow was a widow's only son. And a large crowd from the village was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin and touched it, and the bearers stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, 
get up. So picture the scene, if you will. There are two crowds. One is a smaller crowd. It's a group of guys. They're walking towards town. They're probably talking about, well, hey, when we get to town, let's see if we can find a place to eat. Where are we going to stay? Hey, I know some people here. Let me look them up. And they're just having that normal conversation. And as they're going down the road, they look up, and all of a sudden, there's a large crowd. And this large crowd was obvious what it was, because at the beginning of that large crowd, there was uh, a coffin being carried, proceeding the larger crowd. And in that crowd, though, there was a mother. And of course, she was heartbroken. And every step that she took reminded her of the steps that she'd taken before. For being a widow, her husband had died, and it's very likely that she had made this track before. She knew that after the service, she would go home and maybe a day, maybe two, she'd turn to say something to her son and realize She was all alone. And it was that crowd that this group of smaller men, the smaller group, stopped as they stepped back and very well could have lowered their heads and out of respect, stopped their talking, all except for one. It was Jesus. He looked at the crowd. He looked at the woman. His heart heart overflowed with compassion. And he said, don't cry. You see, it was time to interrupt a funeral. It wasn't the customary thing to do to interrupt a funeral procession, but Jesus didn't always worry about what was customary. He approached the woman and said something almost rude, don't cry. Well, if there was ever a time to cry, that was the time. She had lost her husband some years before. She had lost her only son now. She was totally alone in the world. And Jesus goes up to her and says, don't cry. I'm sure the ones carrying the coffin stopped dead in their tracks. And then Luke records what happened. Jesus went up to them, touched the young man and said, young man, I tell you, get up. And then the boy sat up. And began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Mission accomplished. Funeral interrupted. Jesus wasn't going to let death be the last enemy. He had the final say. Matthew chapter 9. We find Jesus doing what he did best. He was ministering to the needs of people. If you read through Matthew chapter 9, you'll find that Jesus had healed a paralytic man. He had called some of his disciples to following him. He was dealing with some of the charges of the Pharisees who liked to come and challenge him all the time and trap him and and, uh, set a, 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 a trap for him. And then something happened, kind of out of the ordinary. What happened, a man came running up to Jesus and out before him. That wasn't all that unusual, but this man was known by the entire crowd. In fact, he was the ruler of the synagogue, a religious leader, a community leader. And he runs up and bows at the feet of Jesus. And he, through his sobs and his broken voice, says, My daughter has just died, but you can bring her back again to life. If you just come and lay your hand upon her. And Jesus got up and left for the man's house. But when he had got to the house, the funeral, process, the funeral had already started. The house was filled with people and, and flute players. And there were people mourning there. And all of these things had gone on. But Jesus knew it was time to interrupt another funeral. This is what he did. Matthew 9, 9, verses 23 and following, it says, When Jesus entered the ruler's house, he saw the flute players and the noisy crowd. He said, Go away. The girl's not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. And after the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. Jesus entered the crowd, and the crowd was shocked at what he said. Go away. She's not dead, she's just sleeping. And what was their reaction? They laughed at him. They made fun of him. But Jesus never backed down from a crowd, did he? He stood there and he looked at them and they looked at him and guess who won the stare down? 
Jesus did. And he took Peter and James and John and the mother and the father and they entered into that room and there lay the 12-year-old daughter. All the hopes and dreams of those parents lay so silent and still on that bed. And Jesus said, Get up, my child. And the funeral ended. Mission accomplished. Jesus wasn't going to let the last enemy, death, have its final say. John chapter 11. Perhaps the best known story. Robert had referred to it there in the service. It involved some very close people. It involved Jesus. And it wasn't just some stranger that ran up to him. No, in fact, it was people who had actually stayed at their house, the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And they were believers, and and Lazarus had taken ill, and they knew what to do. They believed, and, and they ran to Jesus and said, Jesus, please come, Lazarus is sick. And Jesus says, okay. But he just keeps on teaching, keeps on doing his thing that whole day. Next day comes around. I'm sure the disciples are thinking, well, maybe first thing in the morning we're going to take off and go to Lazarus. And Jesus doesn't. He just gets up and goes about his business and starts doing his thing. No indication that he'd even remembered what they'd asked him to do. And sometime during that day, Lazarus died. And then Jesus wanders into town two days later. And there were a lot of people gathered there. Martha had come to Jesus. Mary could not bring herself to even come out to where Jesus was. But when Jesus came to her, here's what happens in John chapter 11, verses 32 through 39. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here... My brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved them. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man had kept this man from dying? And Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone across its entrance. And he said, take away the stone. Once again, the heart of Jesus connected with the hearts of people. John eleven thirty five, 35, shortest verse in the Bible. First one I ever memorized. Jesus wept. His heart was broken because he was so touched. It it was just not somebody, it was Lazarus. He had dined with him. He had stayed in his house. They had had conversations. Mary and Martha had been his companions, had followed him around. Why didn't he come sooner? He came when the Pharisee came and said, Hey, can you come do this? He had told his disciples, So this is... All been done so that God will be glorified. And you know the story. He comes up in front of the tomb and says, Lazarus, come forth. And he does. And it caused quite a stir because it was four days. In fact, they warned him, said, Jesus, he's going to (laughs) stink. You don't want to take that stone off. And once again, that didn't stop him. Jesus wasn't going to let the last enemy, death, have the final word. Mission accomplished. Funeral interrupted. There was one more funeral Jesus had to interrupt. His own. John chapter 20, verses 11 through 17 Starting verse 1, it says, Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. 
And then down in verse 11, Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot, where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord. She replied, and I don't know where they've put him. She turned to leave and someone saw someone standing there and it was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her, who are you looking for? And she thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken away, tell me where you have put him and I'll go get him. Mary, Jesus said, and she turned to him and cried, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I have yet have, have not yet ascended to the Father. But go and find my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and to your Father and to my God and to your God. Jesus wasn't going to let the last enemy, death, have the final word. He's risen. He's risen indeed. Well, there's one more funeral that Jesus wants to interrupt. And that's yours. No, he may not walk up the aisle and touch you in the casket and have you sit up and start singing or addressing the crowd. But he does have a plan. He does have a plan and it involves eternity. You see, we are all bound on this earthly existence by our earthly bodies. But Easter, if it teaches us nothing, should teach us at least this. There is more to life than what we experience here on this earth. There is an eternity. There is more to getting up than going to work and earning a paycheck and coming home and watching TV and having supper and cleaning the house and mowing the lawn and and, and paying the bills and and getting ready for retirement. There's more to life than all of that. And And Easter teaches us that life here on this earth is merely a preparation for eternity. And Jesus is prepared to interrupt your funeral. Because that's not the end. It's the beginning of eternity. Paul describes it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, but let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. It will happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be changed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Funeral interrupted. Death does not have the last word. Easter teaches us we have something to live for more than the daily routine of life. What's it going to be like? We can't explain it all. In fact, Paul described it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. It's inconceivable. But aren't you thankful that Jesus was the one who is an interrupter of funerals. His own, so that ours too can be interrupted by eternity. I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know where you're at in your relationship with God. I want to encourage you to uh, get it right. I wish I could stand up here and say, none of us are ever going to die physically. And I'm not saying this to scare anybody. I I think it's going to be a revelation to any of us to, to hear that we all are going to die someday. And Easter reminds us 
that this life is a preparation for eternity. And I want us all to be interrupted (laughs) by those words. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into thy rest. Let's celebrate Easter, not because of just the past, because of what it means for eternity.